पतित कृपया श्री गुरु तम नोस्मि गुरवे कौर चंद्राय राधिकाय तदाय कृष्णाय कृष्ण भक्ताय तार भक्ताय नमो आनंद लील माय विग्रहाय हेम प्रत्यप्यचावि सुंदराय तस्मै महाप्रेम रसप्रदाय चैतन्य चंद्राय नमो नमस्ते चैतन्य चंद्राय नमो नमस्ते चैतन्य चंद्राय नमो नमस्ते I offer my heart like flower petals thousands and thousands of times at the feet of my spiritual master because all transcendental components and the beauty the sweetness the personalities the leela the past times they are beyond our physical body mind and intelligence they are beyond our ego there's nothing that we can do to access them only when we surrender to the in the service very humbly of an enlightened soul who has a vision of that world then the grace can descend and fill our hearts so first of all with great gratitude and humility I offer my heart thousands of times at the feet of my spiritual master. Nitilila Prabhistam Vishnupad, Ashtodra Satsishamad, Rupanuga Charivarya, Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami. Secondly, I bow down at the feet of my Guru's Guru and to his Guru and to his Guru and to his Guru and it goes 37 generations. to see krishna himself so i am a foolish and ignorant person i am just trying to get out of the way of the flow of their kindness and their message that it may come from sri krishna himself through the gurus for thousands of years and coming through me oh clean me purify me wash away all my obstacles and their gift can come to you also uh, so the gift is great priceless eternal transcendental treasure and i'm just praying that i can get out of the way uh, then finally i'm bowing down to all of you my very dear brothers and sisters want to call to the so our topic for this evening is perhaps everyone's favorite topic hmm? love right hmm? what is love it's a really common word everyone uses it but really if you dig a little deeply most people they're not very clear and it's a very vague thing uh, You know that Eskimos they have about 25 words for snow. Right? We just have one word for snow, snow. Right? But when you live in a place all the time where snow is everywhere, mm-hmm. then you have all these different words because it's different types, different consistencies and everything. So in English we have this word love, but in Sanskrit there are many many words for love. Uh-huh. And they've been manifested and explained by the great rishis. who live in the plain where there's love everywhere and many different types of it hmm? like bhav prem rati sneha pranay rag anurag rudbhav mohan mad these are all names for different types of love in sanskrit hmm? so in the vedas of india there's a real What? we have to invent the word loveology 
<laughs> the whole science of what love is and all the different flavors. It's so fascinating. So, is love an emotion? You will, you will practice yoga, right? You will practice yoga. So you know what the emotions are. Chitta vrittis. Chitta vritti. Yeah. In the, in, we have a gross physical body yeah, made of earth, water, fire and ether. Then we have an astral body, a subtle body, psychological body inside. And that's the manas, buddhi, ankar, chitta, mind, intelligence, ego, and the basic, the ground of the mind stuff, chitta. And because this, this mind stuff is not steady, it's oscillating. Mm -hmm. That's what our thoughts and feelings are. So in the beginning of the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali famously says, Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is how to restrain all the vrittis, the, the whirlpools and oscillations and turbulence within the, the mind, the field of the mind. So if love were just an emotion of the mind, then yoga would be all about not having any love, right? Because it's about quelling those mundane uh, emotions, feelings and attachments and everything. So love is, can't be just an emotion. Then what is it? Energy. Mm -hmm. Energy. Yeah. Not, not an energy of this world. The Vedas explain that in understanding love, there are two foundational ideas. One is called Vishai and the other is called Ashrai. Yeah. Vishai means the object of love and Ashrai means the abode or the shelter of love. Like Ashram, you know Ashram? It's where you can take shelter. Right? So Ashrai means a shelter. So love has an object and love has an, a, 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 uh, an abode, a shelter. So the Vishai is the thing that you love. And the ashray is the person who is the, the receptacle, who has that love for the object of love. This is really important to understand because love means that the ashray is only thinking about the happiness of the vishay, not their own happiness. See, people say, I love chocolate. Right? Someone can say, I love chocolate. But actually, yeah, okay, so the, the chocolate is the object and you're the ashray of the love. But wait a minute, when you're eating the chocolate, you're not thinking, I hope the chocolate's enjoying this. <laughs> right? You're not even thinking about the pleasure of the object. So, these, I love chocolate, I love my car, I love whatever it is. This is actually not love. Because the, in the ashray, the abode of love, they never consider their own situation they're only absorbed in how can I please the object of love. And this is really important on a deep metaphysical level also. On a very deep metaphysical level. Why? Because, say for example, in philosophies like Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta is um, a kind of misinterpretation of the Vedas that came about in the 8th century. And the idea is that everything is absolutely one. In other words, I am Brahman, the light of Brahman, and so are you. In fact, there's no me and there's no you. There's just this light. Hmm? Like if you, get, if you get a clay pot, so there's air outside of the pot and there's air inside the pot, but it's just some air is separated from the rest now. And if you smash the pot, then the air inside the pot mixes with the air outside the pot. And now there's just one air. There's not air outside and inside. So some persons have the idea that our ego is like a pot that's containing some spirit. So when you break the ego, then everything becomes one. Like this. So this idea is very popular. But if we examine it deeply, if we hold that as a metaphysical, ontological foundation of our belief, then love itself becomes an illusion. Because love means there has to be a lover and beloved. There has to be two. For example, also in uh, in Buddhism, is a Buddhism is a shunyavad, emptiness that actually the self doesn't exist. There's just a flow 
a flow of, of thoughts and these thoughts like a candle should be just blown out and then there's nothing so that's called nirvana hmm? nirvana means fire actually nirvana no fire blow out it's extinct the fire is extinguished so there's no existence anymore like that so if if one's basic idea of reality is ultimately everything is empty then also love becomes a, a, an illusion something of the the temporary mundane world so the the Vedas which describe bhakti say no there's an it for love to be real it must be eternal it must be transcendental and the subject and the object of the love the vishai and the ashrai must themselves be eternally existing mm. so love is the relationship between atma our individual soul and param atma the supreme soul which is the source of all the individual souls mm. this is the essence of the vedas mm. Just, i'm sure you've heard the brahma gayatri you know oh boor Uh -huh. Yeah. So Brahma Gayatri is called Veda Mantra, means the mother of the Vedas. All the other mantras come from that. So if you can understand the Brahma Gayatri, then you'll understand all the Vedas, actually. So here it said, Tat Savitur. Savitur means of the sun. Hmm? That the supreme reality is like the sun. And Dimahi. Sun is singular. And Dibahi means we meditate. It's in the first person plural. In Sanskrit you have a singular, a dual case and plural. So one, two and more than two. So Dibahi means that we, the sages, uh, the bhaktas, the devotees, together, individuals have come together and they're all Dibahi meditating on that one all-powerful supreme truth, the sun from which all the individual photons, our souls are like individual photons emanating from the vast unlimited spiritual sun. So, an love means the eternal relationship between Atma and that Paramatma. Love has some characteristics. The first characteristic is that it's unconditional. Unconditional. So we see throughout the history of the saints, the saints, uh, <laughs> so the saints are very often put into difficult situations. Have you noticed that? Throughout history, whether it was Jesus Christ or Mm. Haridas Thakur or Ramanujacharya or Madhvacharya, great saints and sages in the West and in the East, they undergo persecution very often in this world. Because this is a world of illusion, this is a world of untruth. So when spe people come here and speak the truth, then it's kind of revolutionary. And many persons who are allergic to truth, they, they, they react sometimes violently as well. So. But we see that all the saints, there was one saint in India, his name was Haridas Thakur. And he was chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. You know, he would do, there are 108 beads on the mala, and he would chant one mantra on each bead. So that's 108 times, and there are 32 names in the mantra. So 32 times 108. And then he would go around 192 times a day. So he would chant 300,000 names of God every day. That was his sadhana. And so, I mean, you can try it yourself. If you do that, that's it. You will transcend. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you will see the other side. <laughs> so, he was absorbed in that. But you see, he was born actually in a Muslim family. And, uh, and at that time in Bengal, medieval Bengal, 500 years ago, the emperor uh, was a Muslim. And they don't take lightly to people converting. So he was arrested and they brought him before the king and they said, why are you singing these Hindu songs? And he said, 
there's only one God. Everyone is praying to and trying to realize and serve and love the same God. And also, because God is in the heart of everyone, everyone is inspired to serve and love Him in the ways that He's inspiring them in their heart. So let it be. If God inspires someone to, to serve in this way and someone else to serve in this way, that's at His discretion. We are not to um, become involved in that. We are not to police anyone's faith. Huh? We should not become the faith police. Let the faith flow naturally. It will find its destination eventually. So, so anyway, the magistrate didn't take kindly to that. So he said, you know, if you don't stop this chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, we're going to beat you up. He said, Khanda, Khanda, Hai Deya, Jai, Jari, Pran, Thabawami, Badani, Nachari, Hari, Nam. You can beat me, you can cut me to pieces even. But my tongue will never stop chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Ram. You know why? Because he wasn't doing it voluntarily. You see, when you, when you say, I am going to chant, that's not the mantra. That's just the pr preliminary, rudimentary first step into the university of mantra. It's your first day at school. When one is chanting really sincerely from the heart, then you experience that actually you're not chanting. The mantra itself is coming and taking over your pran and causing your tongue to move and you're just what you're a witness, shakshi. Shakshi means witness. You're just witnessing the appearance of this vibration. It's just like an avatar. Every so many millions of years, the avatars of Krishna and Lord Ram, they come, they play here. Mm. So it's said that God and His holy name, they're, they're not different, they're the same. But there's one difference between God and His name. The name is more merciful. You see? Because Krishna only comes to this world once every 8 billion, 400 million years. But He can appear, He can do avatar in the form of the mantra at any time, if someone is really praying from the core of their heart. And the mantra takes over your tongue, and then takes over your... Uh, you see, all of our thoughts are movements of pran going through the chitta. So when the na name comes, it takes over your pran, and then it takes over your thoughts, and begins to manifest a vision of the spiritual world. So that's really chanting, and seeing the spiritual world is the same thing, actually. But we begin just mechanically, oh, I like to sing, let me clap, let me dance, and we make effort, slowly, slowly, gradually, as our loving service becomes more unconditional. Then, Nam Prabhu, you say in Sanskrit, Nam Prabhu. Mm. Prabhu means my master. My master appears in the form of this sweet vibration that just causes the heart to overflow with love. So he said, okay, I don't care what you do to me, but I can't stop chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, because my tongue is just by itself ruined. So then they took him to a marketplace in front of everyone, and he was beaten with canes, and he was severely injured. But he didn't die. They took him to another marketplace. 22 marketplaces they took him. And he was... Those who were beating him, they were so, they were exhausted. And they said, oh, Haridas, if you don't die, the king will kill us. Please, just, can you die? He smiled at them, he said, oh, why did you say so? If you told me earlier. And because he had complete control over his pride, he just stopped his breathing, stopped his heartbeat and everything. And they thought that he was dead. And they threw his body in the Ganges. But then he animated his pran again and swam out of the Ganges, came out, and he was fine. So, one may say, throughout history, many saints and sages, they had a really tough time. They were persecuted. Isn't God me? No. Yeah. Don't, if you have any hardship in your life, if you have any difficulty in your life, never let that be an excuse to not be 
engaged in bhakti yoga, to be engaged in, de in devotion. It's a test. It's a test. If someone is fully absorbed in bhakti, then the first thing we begin to realize when the chitta becomes steady and clean and shining is that I'm not this physical body. So any difficulty, the problems that come to the body, those whose consciousness is pure, it doesn't affect them. They don't see an obstacle in life, but they see an opportunity. If I can keep serving, if I'll continue to express bhakti, if I'll continue to express devotion, even in this difficult time, then uh, Krishna's heart is so soft, he becomes purchased by that. It's a chance to purchase his heart. So, in the path of bhakti, there is no such thing as problems. If you're on the path of bhakti yoga, you have no problems in life. Because it's said that love is like a lion. And problems are the prey of that lion. Just as a lion eats its prey and becomes strong, so on the path of bhakti yoga, what difficulties and problems come in your life, you welcome them, you devour them, and become strong. <coughs> so this is the first characteristic of love. Unconditional. Uninterrupted. It cannot be checked by anything. It's, bhakti is not done to get something for yourself. It's only for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. Another characteristic, Another characteristic of bhakti is <coughs> that one never forgets Krishna. In the Bhagavad Gita it said, Yo man pasyati sarvatra sarvam chamai pasyati tasyaham na pranasyami sachamena pranasyati See, Krishna said, for one who sees me everywhere and sees everything existing within me, I am never lost to that person and he is never lost to me. So, you know, in Ayurveda, how do you check the health in Ayurveda? It's done by the pulse. Yeah? The Ayurvedic doctor puts three fingers on your pulse. So he, he takes your pulse in three places. And then he presses, and then he presses again. So he takes your pulse in nine places. And by the ratio of the strength or weakness of those nine different pulses, he can read your whole body. So your pulse is like a barcode. It's got all the info there. All your medical history and everything is there in that barcode in those nine pulses. So I write it is very expert and can read your whole body just by the pulse. So in the same way, you can take your pulse now and see how is your bhakti, how is your devotion? Is your devotion continuous like a flow of honey? Said bhakti is, if you pour water from a cup, it splashes here and there and drops. But when you pour honey, it comes out in a thick stream. It doesn't separate from itself, it stays in a flow. So bhakti is the, when your thoughts are in a thick stream of remembrance of Krishna uh, and never become separated into another subject. So you can take your pulse. Uh, is your bhakti like that? Uh, then unconditional. In all circumstances, even in trials and tribulations and in the face of difficulties, uh, do we remain blissful? Do we see problems or do we see opportunities to win the heart of Krishna? And then, the third pulse, do we see God everywhere in the heart of everyone we meet, even the people who get on our nerves? Because he's there too. Pure devotees don't even see friends and enemies because they see everyone is a part of God and God also lives in the hearts of everyone. In the Vedanta Sutra it is said, Guham pravistav atmano hi darshayati There are two atmas in every heart. 
There are two souls in every heart. That person and God also. Both are living there. So, these are three pulses we can take to measure the health. Is our bhakti in robust health, full of strength and longevity? Or is our bhakti in a terminal condition? Why? Is it continuous? Is it unconditional? And is, do we never do we never lose our memory? Are we always seeing Krishna everywhere and everything within him? Like that. So the goal of bhakti is what? To please Krishna. And its side effect is the attainment of what is called Siddha Rup, the spiritual form. The Vedas say, Kesha Gyasya that the soul is very minute. It's like if you take the tip of a hair and you cut it into a hundred pieces, throw away ninety-nine of them and just keep one, and then do it again. Cut that into a hundred pieces, again throw away ninety-nine of what you left, that's roughly the dimension of Atma of the soul. It's very, very subtle. And by Bhakti, what happens is the soul manifests a spiritual form. Right now it's Avyakta. It's not something which is can be described by words. It's a, it's a type of, a, like a spiritual spark of light. But by the practice of bhakti yoga, depending on what type of mood you practice, what type of bhav you practice bhakti in, according to that bhav, according to the mood of your practice, you attain an appropriate eternal spiritual body in which one can interact with the spiritual form of Krishna. Because love should be expressed. So if you're just a spark of light, then how will you be able to embrace Krishna? How will you be able to kiss Him? Right? Okay. So this is the result of bhakti. So there are stages in bhakti. The first is skotsrada or faith. By associating with saints, we get this feeling, I want to serve. I want to serve. And that's called sraddha. The service mood starts. The first flow of seva, seva. And then, Sadhu Sangha, we associate with saints to learn from them. How can I make the seed of, of my mood of service grow and bear the fruit of pure love? So first, Radha, then Sadhu Sangha, association with saints. And then, the next stage is called Bhajana Kriya, your Kriya, your practice. We have to practice every day. So in the beginning, maybe quite difficult. But especially if we have good association of saints and we practice meditation with them, kirtan with them, soon it's very contagious. The spirit of bhakti is very contagious. So we begin our practice and we intensify that. When our practice become, becomes more intensified, the next stage is called anartha nibriti, the removal of all obstacles. Lust, anger, greed, attachment, envy, ego, laziness, Whatever, all these things have to go. They've got to go. And bhakti is so powerful, as it is growing, it washes them all away. And then the stage of nishta comes steadiness. Now you are completely steady. Mind is steady. You can move like a swan, floating on the lake of life, without any anxiety or discomfort. And in that state of steadiness, then the, uh, the heart becomes like a mirror. You can see this mirror just behind, smooth and bright. So anything that comes before it is reflected there. So when the chitta becomes very steady like a mirror, then in that stage you can begin to see the beautiful form of Krishna. Venam konanta maravinda dalaya taksham bhavitam samasitam buddha sundaranga. His hair is decorated with a peacock feather. His complexion is like a fresh rain cloud. Because the devotee is feeling 
the heat of separation, crying, Krishna, where are you? Krishna, where are you? And just as a person in the hot summer feels great relief when the sky becomes filled with the dark rain clouds, and then the rain falls and they feel such relief and happiness. So in the same way, when the devotee is crying and burning in separation, Oh my Lord, where are you? And then the fresh rain cloud complexion, Krishna appears reflected in his heart and showers his grace upon the devotee. So it comes in the stage of nishta. Then, as one's heart becomes cleaner and cleaner, then the sweetness of Krishna begins to manifest. How charming! How charming and attractive he is. You know, he plays a flute. And when see Krishna plays this flute, oh, what can we say? Madhuramambasambhaki Hangsi Matta Prajalpa Paniyakumasambhaki Bringa Sangeeta Gosha Surata Samara Peri Pankriti Putanare Jayati Ridahya Dangsi Kopi Bangsi Nidadaha In that stage of your meditation, the possibility comes to relish the Bhakti poetry, the Sanskrit poetry of Bhakti. Here a saint is realizing when he's chanting, he's hearing in his heart the sound of Krishna playing his flute and calling him. And he's saying, what? How joyful is the sound of this flute? It's like hmm, a swan who, you know, swans, they migrate and they fly for thousands and thousands of miles. Uh, and in India, high in the Himalayas, there's a lake there called the Manas Sarovar. And the Raja Hansas, the king of swans, they fly for thousands of miles and finally they arrive at their destination and they land on that lake. Uh, and it's actually the place where all the swans go to, for mating. So they're very happy when they arrive there. Uh, and when the swans arrive at their destination, they sing and it's very beautiful to hear the calling of swans. So that saint, when he heard the sound of Krishna's flute, he said, this sound is so joyful, it's like the sound of an intoxicated swan landing, not just on a lake of water, but on a lake of amrita, nectar of heaven. And singing. So beautiful. Paniyakuma sabrinda. Paniyakuma sabrinda. Sangeeta Gosha. He's saying it's exactly like you know, bumblebees. Bumblebees are thirsty to take the, taste the nectar of flowers. So if there's a garden full of flowers, you can't even imagine what it's like when a bee sees a garden of flowers. Because actually, flowers have colors which are uh, outside of the range of human vision. But bees have eyes that can see. So they're actually, they're actually um, markings on the flowers we can't even see. Outside of our tiny range, we're only between infrared and ultraviolet. So, but the bees can see that. And when they see a flower garden, and they go and they land on a flower and begin to drink the nectar, the bee is very excited. <laughs> ah, he becomes ecstatic. So this poet is saying, this sound of the flute of Krishna is so sweet, it's as if it's expressing the humming of a thirsty bumblebee who was landed in a garden of flowers made of love. Panaya Kushama Bhaki Bringa Sangeeta Goshaha. Not only that, but Jayati Rida Adanksi, the sound of Krishna's flute is like a snake that bites your heart. Because love, pida bina vakala kuta katataga vasya nirvasa no. Nisyan venas sudam budama durimaham kerna sanko uchana. It is said that love is like a mixture of nectar and poison as well. It's, it's, you can't tell. Is this happiness or distress? I don't know. It's some unspeakable, indescribable experience. <coughs> this love. Why? Because, <clears throat> let's take for example, you've all heard the name of Radha, right? Because we were just saying 
Radha Govinda, Radha Govinda. So Krishna's name is Govinda. And Krishna's full energy of love, hmm? yeah, love is an energy. Good, over there, right. But this energy has two aspects. One is the feeling, and the other is that that feeling condenses. And the, co the condensed form of the highest expression of love is called Radha. So when we say Radha Krishna or Hare, Hare actually means Radha. You see? When you say Radha, that's her name. When you call her, it becomes Radhe in the vocative case. So the word Hara means a female person who is a thief. And when you call her, it becomes Hare, like Radha becomes Radhe. So Hare means that female Shakti, Radha, who is a thief, who steals Krishna's heart. So this mantra, Hare Krishna, is a meditation of, on the God, Krishna, the God of love, and His full energy of love. And how they meet. So, mm -hmm. that love of Radha Krishna is so intense, that when they're not together, then they feel very deep pain of separation from each other. And then when they meet, they're so eager to meet, that even being together, they become worried about when they have to separate again. So there's a feeling of separation even in the meeting. So love is like that. The fire of separation, the poison of separation, and the sweetness of meeting is mixed together, even when they're together or when they're apart. It's indescribable. So, here the poet is saying, Surata samara bheri bankriti putanare the playing of Sri Krishna's flute is so beautiful. It's like the beating of drums. Boom, boom, kettle drums. That takes place before a battle. In Vedic times when the warriors meet, like in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, in the first chapter, the armies of warriors are on one side and on the other. And before the battle takes place, they beat drums and blow their conch shells. And it signals, now we're ready for war. Mm -hmm. So, in, in the uh, Kam Shastra, Kam Shastra, Kam Sutra, then the meeting between lover and beloved is like a battle. Mm -hmm. Who will win? No one can say. But when Krishna plays upon his flute, it's like the beating of drums to announce now there will be a battle of love between Radha and Krishna. So, when the devotee is chanting the holy names, first his heart becomes steady, then he begins to see the form of Krishna, and then the sweetness of Krishna, and the sound of Sri Krishna's flute. And then, as one goes on chanting, the vision becomes broader, and one begins to see the associates, the divine angels, the eternal lovers of Krishna. They're called gopis. Have you heard of this word, gopi? Hmm? Actually, sometimes people get upset when they hear that Krishna is dancing with so many beautiful coward maidens in the night. They think, what is this? That's terrible. Hmm? I like Ram, because he's just got one wife, Sita. Hmm? Lord Ram, Ram is great. He loves Sita. He doesn't have any romantic relationship with anyone else. Ram is good. Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Jai Sita Ram. Hmm? But this Krishna fellow, hmm, not so sure about him. Huh? Not only does he love Radha, but then there's Lalita and Vishaka and Chitra and Champakalata in the lake, Aranga Devi, Sudevi, and many Chandravi, Bhadrashai, Padman. So many, many gopis. Hmm? They're all described in the Vedic literature. And he has love affairs with all of them. What's going on here? So, don't criticize Krishna. He's perfect. He's perfect. But there's a deep mystery behind it. And that is that, that Radha, she wants to love Krishna in so many ways, different ways, all at the same time. And so, one mood of love has condensed and become one gopi. 
another mood of love has condensed has become another gopi. So actually all of those gopis, those colored girls that Krishna dances with in the moonlight, on the bank of Jamuna, or in playing in the caves of Govardhan, or in Radha Kund, uh, in this beautiful Leela of love, every single one of them is nothing but the love of Radhika taking many different forms. So she can love him in all those different ways at the same time. So just as someone will think, oh, Sita Ram, yes, Ram's very nice because he only loves one person. So Krishna actually only loves one person. But she's playing in so many different forms. That's the essence of the, the, the Rasa Lila. So, in the, in the next stage of Bhakti, after realizing the sweetness of Krishna, then one begins to realize those associates those expansions of Radha and by being absorbed in chanting and remembering them then their feeling of love becomes reflected into our heart and when it touches us we transform into their likeness and so by the kirtan gradually gradually you can develop an eternal beautiful spiritual form just like those embodiments of Radha's love for Sri Krishna So that is the topmost goal. So I think we got, we'll sing another kirtan just now. Does anyone have any burning questions? Any lukewarm questions? <laughs> so we're all very fortunate to come in contact with this tradition which offers us the greatest possible prospect, not only to experience the joy in this life, not only to be liberated, nirvana, but to go beyond nirvana and participate in the spiritual form in the eternal loving pastimes of Sri Krishna. It's a marvelous, unprecedented opportunity.